I have thought for some time that this was coming, but I assumed I'd be dead before it arrived. There's been a long, long process by which the people of this country have gradually surrendered their liberty in return for various forms of safety or comfort. And it has reached, or had reached before last year, a stage where I thought that uh, really we were pretty much finished as a free society, but that it would be a while before this would have any really serious concrete effect on most people's lives. And I was wrong about that. It came in a form I didn't expect more quickly than I expected. It has come in the form, uh, particularly and startlingly, in what I never expected, in the form of, of a disease of which people are told is so serious and so dangerous that the only way that they can protect themselves against it is to surrender a huge amount of their freedom and independence. Not just civil liberty, but their freedom as individuals to take actions on their own initiative. Now, people don't listen to what they don't want to hear. There is no more impregnable fortress on the planet than a closed mine. My name is Peter Hitchens. Uh, I'm a journalist and an author. I've been in my trade now for more than 40 years. I was born in the British Empire in uh, an age now completely vanished. Well, in my life, I think I must have visited now 57 different countries and came to the conclusion that the most precious possession which we have in this country is that of liberty. That is to say, we begin, we're born as free men and women. And this unique and precious possession is now disappearing before our very eyes. Now, I have this strong belief that what you inherit uh, from your forebears, you pass on to your children and grandchildren, and as far as possible, undamaged. And what frightens and distresses me very much about the current age is that we have this extraordinary precious jewel in our possession, which we are throwing away. You should worry about this because liberty is not just an abstract concept. It decides how you live, how you die. It decides how you raise your children. It decides ultimately what you're allowed to think. And if you don't care about it, you'll find that sooner or later it makes you care about it. We're throwing away our liberty. We're willingly and in some cases cheerfully throwing it away because we have ceased to value it and in fact increasingly feel comfortable being told what to do rather than deciding what to do ourselves. It relieves us of responsibility, relieves us therefore of guilt for our own decisions, uh, makes us in a lazy way happier. It's irresponsible because the liberty which we have is not ours to dispose of. It's, it's something which, we are, which we're supposed to pass on to those who are not yet born, and we're failing to do that. This is probably the most, the most obvious way in which people surrender their freedom. And this is a, a, a very old process. I call it distilling power out of fear. Uh, the government and the authorities and society as a whole come to the individual and say, you will be safer if you do what we tell you to do. Surrender to us your freedoms, whether it is to travel, uh, to, to, to work even, to, uh, to complain. And in return, you'll be safe from this terrible peril which uh, we have set before you, and which if you do not protect yourself against it, will destroy you. And there are moments in all our lives when we, we, we are grateful to be spared from, from decisions because decisions are hard to take. You don't know whether they're going to be wrong, right? And it's, it's not, it, we're all subject to this. And if someone offers us a relief from responsibility, we will very often take it. If you hand over those decisions to other people, you simply are, are, will never grow to the full size of a, of, a, of a human being and human mind. You will be a lesser creature than you would otherwise have been because your, your, your muscles your mental muscles for, for taking these decisions and, 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 and pursuing these thoughts will not develop. There are four key dates in our decline from being a more or less free country to what we are now. 1914, 1964, 1997 and 2020.
1914, the, the First World War in general, is as significant a moment in human history as the fall of the Roman Empire. You get uh, in, in the country involved, in, in this country for the first time, the introduction of military conscription, forcible service in the army, uh, an, an absolutely unprecedented attack on personal liberty. You get, of course, the, the huge disruptive effect on family life, which the taking away of the, of, the, of, the, of the husband and father from hundreds of thousands of families simultaneously creates. Uh, you get the enormous increase in the power of the state directing uh, the economy and society in general, right down to the rationing of food, things never previously seen. Before the First World War, the only agency of the state that most people ever saw was a postman delivering their letters and a policeman walking past the end of their street. But by 1918, that was transformed. We suddenly lived in a society in which the state was immensely powerful and interfered in everything that we did. And then there's the immense state interference in the economy. Uh, again, never previously contemplated, to directing everything towards war. To get this to happen, uh, the country had to be whipped into a state of, of almost hysterical fury about the German enemy and the, 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 the atrocities which were supposedly being conducted in Belgium and the great goal of the rescue of civilization, the Hanis at the gate. Uh, and so you, you, you create in the public a mood of simultaneous mass fear and mass anger, uh, which sustains this. And of course, by doing so, you also make it incredibly difficult to end. It becomes very difficult uh, for anybody to actually stand up against it because you then become a German lover. And this is, this is there was a period when, 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 when people are kicking Dachshunds in the street because they're German. Hysteria has been unleashed, which is almost impossible to oppose. The whole world was transformed by the 1914-18 war, and without it, there would have been no Lenin, no Stalin, no Mussolini, no Hitler. Uh, without it, the United States would not have risen to the rank of, of supreme world power or anything like. So quickly, the British Empire would probably have survived for much, much longer than it did. The crises created by the First World War were then resolved or taken to a different level by the Second World War, which consolidated much of the change in the way the world was organized and much of the change in the way this country was organized, as did, of course, the, the Labour government of 1945, which turned into peacetime measures much of the state control and interference in life, which had become normalized by the Second World War. But the, the, the triumph of the Soviet Union as the major power in Europe after 1945 and the beginning of the Cold War had a very strange and paradoxical effect. Here we were, uh, all the Western countries, supposedly in a, in a, a cold, that is to say, not actually shooting war with a, a, a major power which we believe threatened us. But instead of this being, as it might normally have been, a pretext for the limitation of liberty, because we were fighting a, a tyranny, and a communist tyranny at that, uh, we really couldn't, the countries involved on, the, on, on the, the free side of the Cold War, really couldn't engage in many measures restricting or limiting freedom. So in 1964, we got a, a, a cultural revolution. And cultural revolutions have implications for liberty. The uh, Labour government in 1964, it was the first step in a cultural revolution which was then resumed, I think, very much in the 1990s. If you look at Anthony Crossland's Future of Socialism or Roy Jenkins' Labour Case, the, 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 the thoughtful intellectual books produced before the 64 Labour victory, what you'll see it was about was, was not so much about nationalising industry or economic intervention. It was very much about changing the way in which life was lived. Uh, in terms of morality, uh, family life, uh, making divorce much easier, uh, Roy Jenkins's homosexual law reforms. Uh, also, Roy Jenkins is very important in a complete revolution in the way in which criminal justice operated. Very much more the social democratic view that crime was a product of society rather than of wickedness, uh, and a, 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 a great restructuring of criminal justice to be much less punitive and deterrent and much more aimed at rehabilitation. 
at the same time, it's absolutely astonishing, unexamined revolution in the way in which the country was policed. Instead of being policed uh, by preventive foot patrols, so the police were always present and visible, it was policed in a reactive fashion afterwards. Uh, say crime, you waited for crime to happen and then you, uh, and then you chased after it. And this has had profound effects on society. And it, it's connected in many ways with the, with the rehabilitatory uh, function of the courts and the prisons and was also, in my view, a complete failure. But leaving that aside, it was an immense change in the way in which things were done. And the, the, the reason why the abolition of the death penalty was so important, even though very, very small numbers of people were actually executed in those days, was because it was the keystone, the, the, the idea that someone could be, could be executed for murder, it was the keystone of the idea that people should be punished for committing crimes. Uh, and it, it, you couldn't have a, a system of rehabilitation, a sort of social work criminal justice system, which had at its very summit uh, an absolutely unquestionable punishment. So that had to go. And it went. It changed the nature of society. It actually, it, it almost certainly made society more violent and led to the arming of the police. But it, it, because what the death penalty had deterred was not so much murder as the carrying of lethal weapons and the use of lethal weapons by criminals. States always kill people. They maintain armed forces and train them for that purpose. Uh, the armed police, which we increasingly have, kill people. States are responsible for killing people. What they're not prepared to do uh, is to kill people as a just punishment uh, after due process uh, for the supreme crime, which is, which is murder, the taking of innocent life. And they're not prepared to do that because fundamentally they don't believe in the concept of punishment. It's not that they're squeamish about killing people because as we see, they still do it. It's because they, they hate the idea of punishment and they themselves don't want to have any responsibility for it either. But these revolutions were embarked upon and then there was the educational revolution, uh, which was not fully understood by those who pursued it. And Anthony Crossland's enthusiasm for getting rid of, of selective state grammar schools was, was immense. Uh, the main result of it was, again, to have a, a, a relativistic education system rather than one based on the authority of the teacher and a series of things which had to be learned by discipline classes and a hierarchy of those who, who were better able to be educated than those who weren't, ultimately an, an elitist form of education, a democratic form of education in which every, everything was open to all. Education was a form of discovery. Uh, teachers had, didn't have authority. They had to charm and persuade. It's an enormous revolution in the way society is run. And it, it changed everything. And again, these things are hugely underestimated in history of the year. And then the absolute, the, the absolutely vital part of the, of the reforms as well was the, was the divorce law reforms of 68, 69. Uh, fascinating thing, civil law, uh, based on the idea that if you make a contract and you break it, uh, the law will intervene on the side of the person who made the contract against the person who broke it. In marriage law, after, uh, after the Labour government's reforms, it's the person who tries to, who wants to keep the contract uh, who finds the courts are against him or her. The person who breaks the contract finds the law on his side. The, the whole marriage contract was transformed from being a lifelong private commitment between two people uh, into a state-regulated arrangement which could be broken pretty much at any time uh, by one of the parties. And the party who broke it would then find the laws on their side. Absolutely immense invasion of private life. Down to the point where, in fact, this very rarely happens, but technically somebody who didn't want to be divorced uh, could be dragged from the family home by the police if they wouldn't go. As, and this, this, was a, this, this was a huge change because it, by removing uh, particularly the strength of the, of the married family from the heart of society, and making, it made the state much more responsible for the upbringing of children and for the outcome of, of, of that upbringing. And it left parents and families much, much weaker. And again, tended towards the creation of a stronger state. I don't think the people who designed it or sought it ever intended that. I think their intentions were good, but I think the outcomes were bad. A country which decides that it's going to get rid of more or less religiously based ideas of punishment for crime, a country which decides that it's going fundamentally to weaken the family, will appear to many of its friends and indeed neutral observers as if it's creating liberty. But the trouble with these things is that they actually, by removing responsibility and choice from individuals, 
place them in the hands of the state and tend towards the creation of a stronger state to deal with people who are no longer restraining themselves in the ways that they did under the old dispensation. Well, on the, the night of the election, 1997, I actually laughed at the way the BBC were covering it. And then the following morning, the arrival of, of, of Blair and his entourage in Downing Street. I thought they're treating this like a sort of new dawn, a, a revolution. Later on, it came to me that fake as that event in Downing Street is and always will be, that there had been a, a revolution and that we had undergone a, a genuine change and that the, the world was irreversibly, in this country, irreversibly different afterwards. And if you're me and you're a former revolutionary Marxist, you can see among many of the leading figures of New Labour, Stephen Byers, Alan Milburn, Alistair Darling, Blair himself, uh, Peter Mandelson, John Reed, uh, and these are people we know about, enormous numbers of people who were, who were swept up in the wave of revolutionary fervor in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Did they suddenly stop? I mean, I did. I became a, a black reactionary, but they they, uh, they didn't. And I think the huge numbers of people uh, took part in a long march through the institutions, which by 1997 was in place in the universities, in broadcasting, in the media, in the schools, to a large extent in the civil service, but still wasn't in parliament. It hadn't got a parliamentary majority. For the first time after 1997, the government in Downing Street was in step with the spirit of the elite classes. And suddenly they could do all the things which they wanted to do. Some of them were economic. The enormous increases in state spending, which Gordon Brown engineered were an important part of it. Some of them were in foreign policy. Britain ceased to have, I think, pretty much for good after that, an independent foreign policy based on defense of itself as a nation and started in engaging in, in utopian foreign interventions instead and also subsuming itself as much as it possibly could into the European Union, which was its chosen part at the time. But the social changes, the, the, the beautifully symbolized by the abolition in public documents of the word husband, uh, put, finished off a lot of the social and cultural changes begun by the Wilson government of 1964 to 70. Uh, and the whole, the, 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 the whole sexual revolution was enormous because the, the revolutions of the 60s, uh, they weren't interested in seizing the post office and the barracks and the railway station with ridiculous Edwardian stuff. They'd understood that if you want to seize control of society, it's the television studio and the school classroom. That's where you want to be. And also you want to be in charge of the culture. To me, there was something um, more or less the, the end of the last traces of Christianity as being really the official ideology of this country. I mean, if you look at the coronation service in 1953, which is fascinating to look at, it is an actual declaration that this is a, a country based upon Protestant Christianity. That is its, its, its main driving force as an idea. But the passing of the, in 2010, which I think is a crowning achievement in some ways, of the Blair government of the Equality Act, uh, ended that and it very significantly. In fact, it, it, it made all religions equal. So Anglican Christianity was equal to Jainism or Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, just one other religion. The, the actual official ideology of the country was what is called equality and diversity. Uh, a hugely revolutionary set of, of, of opinions on how we should conduct ourselves, how we should organize our private and public lives. And that was the key to it. Obviously, the, another part of, of, of Labour was the, the understanding, which still eludes an awful lot of conservatives, that the, the comprehensive educational revolution was a political action designed to make the country more equal. It's fundamentally it's political egalitarianism, nothing to do with education. Uh, everyone went on and on about how the Labour had abandoned Clause 4 and the pledge to nationalise industries. No one cares about who nationalises industries. It's not important anymore, especially when you have regulation of the strength we now have, wh whether you have nationalisation or not. The, the real Clause 4 of new Labour was its absolute commitment that there would be no return to selection viability in, in education. A wholly irrational policy from the point of view of education quality, but an utterly rational policy if you see the schools as an engine of egalitarian propaganda and, and indoctrination. Those are the key parts of, uh, of, of New Labour. And it was a revolution. And it's one which then went on to another stage, 
which was the transformation of the Conservative Party uh, into a Blairite Euro-communist effectively party. Not, they didn't expect the Tories to believe in Blairism or to become Euro-communists or even to understand what it was they were doing. But what it did do is it bludgeoned them into accepting that all these things were a fait accompli and they would only get back into government if they governed according to those rules, which they have done ever since. Well, the, th the thing about a, a, a utopian government, and the Blair government was a utopian government, and those which have followed have been the same, so they believe very strongly that what they're doing is good, that it's kind, uh, that it's generous, uh, that it will build a new and more uh, admirable society. And once you believe that, then you obviously find anybody who criticizes you or gets in your way extremely irritating and a nuisance, and you increasingly believe that they should be pushed out of the way. Uh, it, it creates an atmosphere in which opposition is no longer treated as opposition, but as subversion. And I think that the, 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 most, the most crucial way in which this was done, the, the, the real the, the threat to liberty, although the, the Blair government had, had, had no time for liberty, wanted to introduce identity cards, did introduce long periods of pretrial detention on the pretext of terrorism. In fact, it's terrorism legislation is fundamentally illiberal. The, the main achievement that is, is the one I, I, I harp on about so much, the transformation of the Tory party into another version of, the, of, of, of New Labour. I, I have thought for some time that this was coming, but I assumed I'd be dead before it arrived. There's been a long, long process by which the people of this country have gradually surrendered their liberty in return for various forms of safety or comfort. And it has reached, or had reached before last year, a stage where I thought that uh, really we were pretty much finished as a free society, but that it would be a while before this would have any really serious concrete effect on most people's lives. And I was wrong about that. It came in a form I didn't expect more quickly than I expected. It has come in the form, particularly and startlingly, and one I never expected in the form of a disease of which people are told is so serious and so dangerous that the only way that they can protect themselves against it is to surrender a huge amount of their freedom and independence. Not just civil liberty, but their freedom as individuals to take actions on their own initiative. They simply no longer are expected to do that. The, the number of rules which they must follow, if they follow those rules, they will be safe. If they defy or fail to follow those rules, they will not be safe. And what's more, they should really be on guard against those among them who don't follow those rules. And this is perhaps the most, the creepiest thing about it. Uh, those of us who have felt skeptical about this have felt a strong pressure from our fellow men and women uh, that we are behaving irresponsibly, not just towards ourselves, but towards them. It's enormously powerful, and it makes people guilty about acting as, as free human beings. And the majority now rules completely. Uh, the minority is utterly without power or influence. It, it, it can't even apply the brakes. And so we have that, that's another way in which we have become less free in a material, measurable way. We simply aren't, uh, there is simply no force near the top of society which opposes the will of the majority. And so when Lord Hailsham said this country was an elective dictatorship, which must be 30 odd years ago, uh, in, 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 in those days the dictatorship was moderated by the fact that there was an opposition, that there was an independent civil service, uh, that there was an independent judiciary. But again, what's been demonstrated to us over the past year is that the civil service has now become completely an instrument of the government, and the judiciary would not even hear cases uh, su subjecting the actions of the government to judicial review. Now, it seems to me that if the government is actually ruling the country by decree on the basis of an obscure uh, Public Health Act uh, passed more than 30 years ago, the, the very least the courts would be interested in doing so, but not a thing. And as, as for the civil service, it acts now completely as the, uh, as, as the instrument of government. There's no independence visible in anything that it does. So we've lost very important constitutional protections. Nobody needed to pass an act of parliament for this to happen. Uh, it was a change in the nature of our society, the change in the nature of our politics, a change also very much in the nature of the education which, uh, which we provide and, and, and subsidize and which is considered valuable. 
but these things, these changes have happened without, uh, without any moment at which you could say, oh, a revolution has happened, there has been a putsch or a coup d'etat, there hasn't been one. Uh, everything's happened in slow motion and by salami slices. But at the end of it, as we, we've discovered in the past few months, uh, we are actually living in a different kind of society from the one which we, in which I grew up. Very, very different. But it's also, it's a Kierkegaardian revolution. Right? His great statement that the revolutions which leave all the buildings standing and leave everything looking exactly as it did before, but fundamentally change the nature of society are the most successful to, most people don't realize they've happened. I think the case is closed. I think the government succeeded in mobilizing the population to support its policies on, on COVID-19. And I think that that will be the conclusion of any inquiry that is held. It may be that in some far distant time, Martian historians will write an account of it in which they will point out that uh, they were mistaken. But I wouldn't sit around waiting for that to happen if I were you. Liberty grows in certain very unusual conditions. You might find it, uh, if you find it around you, if you're born into it, then you should uh, bless your good fortune. Uh, but the idea that you can create it by a manifesto or a series of acts of parliament is a mistake. It's very easy, on the other hand, to destroy. Uh, in, in my view, it's a, it's a lost battle, uh, but it's worth recording. Uh, that it was lost and how it was lost, in case it's of use to somebody in the future who also has a, a, a fine and wonderful free civilization and is surrounded by people clamoring to get rid of it for what appear to be good reasons. Uh, vigilance against that is probably the only thing we can pass on to anybody in the future who will wonder how we actually started the 20th century with a tremendously free a prosperous and happy society and ended it as we look like ending it now. What we are talking about, yes, is the, is the slow death of freedom because people don't really want it anymore. Uh, they prefer the security, the absence of responsibility. Uh, they think that it will free them from fear if they're under a stronger, more powerful state which tells them what to do. It's an understandable thing. I understand completely why people feel this way. I just think it's a terrible mistake. Well, I think that's all we can be now, is a warning to other civilized and free societies of how easy it is for such societies to choose a path which ends with them ceasing to be free. And those people who value freedom and still have it, and where it isn't under the same threat as it is here, should, should pay attention to that. And maybe at some point in the future history of the world, people will look at what happened here and realize that it is possible to start a period as a free, prosperous and happy society and end it in the grip of a strong state. I've, I've had a life that uh, has been extraordinarily fortunate in terms of experience. Uh, basically, I've had enough experience, enough danger, pain and other things in my life to have grown up. I don't think most people in my generation ever grew up. I am what I am because I know more than most people. I've seen more than most people. But I know that most people find what I think and what I say to be shocking. And that's why I've lived a different life from them. And I can't, I simply haven't got it within me uh, to communicate the whole experience. I can only explain where it's, that it has led me to certain things, much harder to explain how it's led me to those things. Most people don't hear what I say. Uh, most people who think they agree with me don't hear what I say. And almost all of those who think they disagree with me don't hear what I say. Uh, they're not listening. Uh, people don't listen to what they don't want to hear. There is no more impregnable fortress on the planet than a closed mind. And I don't think that there's really very much future for, um, for people like me who want to obtain uh, improvements in the world through argument and debate. I'm sorry to have to say it, but I think it's true. I think the, the, the resort of existing democratic lawful authorities to the use of, of fear and manipulation to obtain their objects suggests that they've come to the same conclusion. Well, where there are any pockets and islands of liberty left, or even if they reappear among us, my advice to anybody who was fortunate enough to find themselves in such a place is don't squander your inheritance. Don't, don't act as if it was unimportant uh, value what you have. Look 
at the history of the past and see what happens to those who give away their, their precious possessions. Uh, you won't get them back, 